you know, the tricky part about these acts, especially when you have a lot of them, is you got to learn how to manage them because each guy is different. Like, you know, with Billy Ray, you know, you're best to have your phone calls before noon. You get him in the morning. You know what I mean? And then he was clear and on it. And he was great. Great to deal with. Really good guy. Still love him today. Still communicate with him all the time. Really good guy. Uh, you know, other guys, you got to get him at two o'clock in the morning. That's the way it was with like Joe or Johnny Depp. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back again for part two with our guest from earlier this week. But first, I'm going to introduce myself, Siobhan Cronin, here with my cohorts in whatever. I don't want to say crime. I don't even know what the right descriptor is. But I'm sure Ben's committed a crime in the recent, you know, the last few weeks. <laughs> He's probably admitted to some crimes on this podcast. Postal so, crimes. Usually I send things out that are like 1.2 pounds. It's just one pound. And the post office hasn't caught up with me yet. I mean, I, I think I, they usually get there. So there we have Benny Goodman. Admitting to a felony. <laughs> Admitting to a felony. <laughs> and uh, after that, we have Corey Peza, not in any particular order. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, part two with Paul Geary. Part one, we got into a lot of his background as a drummer, as a musician, playing with Extreme, playing at Wembley Stadium. Here, you know, this episode, we get in a little more to his management that switch into that life. Yeah. How you how you go from being just in this massive band, uh, you know, everyone's dream of being a rock star and then saying, you know what? There's something more for me and, and taking a left turn and, and then continuing to grow in success. Not to spoil everything, but it, I can tell you part of it. It's trademarking the name Dream because John Stamos was in a band called Dream. And so was Paul Geary. That was the first episode. No, I know. Well, that's okay if you missed that detail. But that was that was the foreshadowing <laughs> to the fact that they are the most business savvy people. But namely, Paul Geary is a super business savvy person. That even though he was a great drummer in a great band with arguably like my man crush, my favorite guitar player on the planet, Nuno Betancourt and Gary Sharon and Pat Badge. I love them all. They're all amazing people, all amazing players. But Paul Geary transcended the music. To a point where he's now working with people like Joe Perry and Johnny Depp. And he has to get in the heads of these guys. You know, and he, and he tells stories about, you know, what it's like to work with a dude that, you know, people that are so big that they almost don't seem like, you don't know how to, to think about it. It's always a story with Joe Perry or Johnny Depp, right? Of course. And even before that, just the story of how to pivot within the music industry, going from being a musician to the management side and doing that maybe before you're ready. He's got such a great story about how he transitions from one spot to the other. Absolutely. So stay tuned. Part two with Paul Geary. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of 2020. I'm Siobhan Cronin, and I'm here with my cohorts in crime, my co-hosts, my friends, Benny Goodman. Hello. And Corey Peza. Hey, that was a very kind intro, Siobhan. <laughs> and we have part two with our incredible, incredible guest. And if you haven't listened to part one, get the fuck on it because I literally cried the for the first on time <laughs> on 2020. Wait, did you actually so make her cry? I, That's I don't know awesome. if you saw, but I was, my eyes were like completely I was watering. getting close. I was about to say, like, I promised myself I wouldn't cry. You cried? This is so great. Yeah, I was like, I was like choking up like this. Like, I always so, try to make her moving, cry. Yeah, I don't even want to give it away because people just have to go back and listen to it. But we're here again with Paul Geary, amazing drummer, artist, manager, artist in general, philosopher. What other words do you use, Ben, to describe people? The coolest all, all these guy. Other things. In, the coolest guy in the that room, always. That, like, no, yeah, just no, like, oh my is, God, such good stories. I don't even know what to say. I'm just blown I, away. I, I would say that Rihanna wrote a song from his perspective called The Only Girl in the World. <laughs> Because I feel like when I hang out with Paul Geary, I feel like the he makes me feel like I'm the only girl in the world. And he's that's why he's such every, a good manager. He's going to make every person listening to this podcast feel like the only girl, the only guy, whatever in the world. Because the way he tells the stories of the experiences he's had all over the world, playing music. I mean, yeah, you just have to listen to it because it's like you can't, I, I wouldn't be able to shut it off. So here wow. we are back for part two. Wow, that, that was bigger than the, than the, Brian May introduction. <laughs> no, <today>. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what, yeah, what a way to end off the first episode. So maybe, I don't even know, where do we start? I guess we pick up from there. Well, so, you know, 
listen, on another podcast, one that's a little bit more racy than this, maybe, um, I'll tell you some backstage stories from that night because there are some. Well, I won't make the mistake of blowing up your spot by telling people everything, but I do know some of these stories and they're fantastic. And I, and this I just, podcast is plenty racy. Share whatever you, 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 you want to share. You, there are no are you okay sharing with it? Because well, I know that I certain, certain persons in recovery. I thought fine. about it. They're fine with yeah, it. I thought about it before. Um, thought better of it before that maybe I shouldn't share it. But then I realized that Duff from Guns N' Roses has actually written a book and all this shit's in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your call and any stories you want to share. Totally uh, fine. Yeah. Well, let's, let's continue on this. What we're, what? Yeah. yeah. So we take can it away. Stay. So what, how good Girl. are the drugs that Duff does? How good are they? <laughs> <laughs> Never done them with them. Okay. Well, we'll get, right, we'll, ben, we'll get into, well, even then. So, okay. We'll, we'll stop from where we were. We'll start from where we were last. You just blew up <laughs> Wembley stadium. With Extreme, you have the number one song. I, wasn't it like the number one song of the year or something? Or like up there as far as like well, you got... It, it was the most played song in America for the year. You guys were like the dark side of the moon for pop bands, but really yeah. funk metal. It was, it was giant. I mean, and the interesting thing about it, even today, 25 years later, 27, whatever it is, years later, the song is still active across radio um you see as recently as you know a, a year or two ago uh jack black you know uh, covered the song on the air as a spoof with uh, <laughs> uh jimmy fallon um, right or how jimmy about fallon. the voice you had gwen stefani and yeah. whatever that other I mean, those other people is, are a major film comes out and they they use it or like, and I'm always blown away that I'm going, oh my God, this is still going. Always you know, sunny but, in Philadelphia. Yeah, well. They all start I singing now, it. I think now it's reached classic status, you know. Oh, yeah. After, after that much time. So that's very exciting. So look, so Wembley. After that, uh, it after took that. the band to the whole next level. So we came back. We put out our next album that we were recording during the time that that happened in, uh, I think it was in 92 or early 93. I'd say 93. We released Three Sides to Every Story, which an album that we, in fact, recorded mostly in Florida, except the really elaborate third side of the record, which was completely orchestrated with a, with a major live orchestra and everything that goes with that, that we recorded at Abbey Kind of like Lost Symphony, our sponsor. Yeah, we didn't record at Abbey Road. <laughs> Except I, it's just me <laughs> with you screaming through a booth, so. Yeah, without Nuno. Yeah. So anyway, go on. <laughs> we recorded that at Abbey Road in London with Brian May and his arranger from the Queen sessions um that came in and it was the wildest thing because i had already finished my drum parts in florida but we were all in the studio with brian um at that time and recording in the room you know where the beatles delivered so much of that of their you know catalog and in there is where the orchestra uh, happen and seeing you know live strings and you know everything that was going horns um if you listen to the third side of of that three sides record um you will hear all that plus some pretty cool brian may shit guitar shit going on uh during the third side that not a lot of people know about what's what but if you listen you guys as musicians will pluck i just want you to know that i actually went on road trips where my mom did puffy paint of our actual like we hit like 15 states in like 12 days or whatever and i had like three cds <laughs> and two oh. of them were porno graffiti in extreme three sides to every story and i can assure uh. you that everything from the breath that pat's taking when nuno's looking at him wrong to brian may's uh. weird textural things oh i've listened to it many a time and in fact i think i even remember sitting in a pool with you and Ernie Bach one time, going, we should put that on. And you made me listen to it, and you're like, this is when this all happened. And that was one of the best times of my life, which, again, you forgot, just like that Roger Daltrey song at the end of the set, um, where you actually explained to me 
to the best of your recollection, recollection, what actually happened on that side? Because I had been wondering my entire life across <laughs> all of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So where was I? He said, yeah, right, you so, derailed it. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. anyway, so anyway, we were recording at Abbey Road with, with um, no big deal. Brian May at the, the helm pretty much. And that was incredible. The record came out. Um, it immediately went to gold in the U S um, it. And at that time, you know, because I would say in part by the queen thing that happened, we came back to tour on three sides and we sold out Wembley arena two nights um, on our own. I think like that's like 180,000 tickets or something. No, 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 no. Wembley arena. Oh, that's oh, like, oh, oh, oh. You know, Jesus, not stadium, uh, arena. Very different. Yeah, yeah. That's like what, like yeah. 60,000 or 50,000 or something? No, the, 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 the arena is right across the street from the stadium, actually. And it's about 13,000 tickets. Okay, I lied. Where, where the, cool. the stadium's like 95,000 or something. You know? So, but we played there two nights. We sold out two nights. And for our encore again, Brian came, we rehearsed new Queen songs. And we, as an encore, we, we came, Brian joined us and our opening act on, on that tour was Neil Sean's band um, from journey. Um, and he, so when the show ended, Neil came up and it was Brian may Neil Sean and Nuno. And they, they, they stood, you know, on the same side of the stage, the three of them. And we played, uh, tie your mother down again and but now we did it with offshoots and solos so those three guys could were, were trading off solos uh which are you going to release we, this this live record sometime because you guys have never released a live record to my recollection um well, and w- i, I want to hear this dude i'm kind of well, annoyed yeah, we actually have that recorded um <clears throat> on um, dat that's probably is uh, <laughs> i don't know if they had dat yet Anyway, we played um, two nights at Wembley, which was was really amazing. And as a result of what happened at Wembley, when we met Roger Daltrey, he invited us to his estate in in England. And we went and and we get so we have the day off and there we are. We're we're freaking out, you know, being over Daltrey's house and we're going out to the yard because we're going to have a barbecue. And there's a guy, this long haired dude is on the barbecue, you know, flipping burgers and doing his thing. And, and Roger takes us out and says, Oh, you guys gotta all meet each other. You know, th- this is our JP. And I go, Oh yeah, I'm Paul and Nuno. And <clears throat> this is JP's fiance. And I go, Oh, so <clears throat> we're just shooting the shit. And <clears throat> it came up, hair care products came up because the wife was saying something like, Oh, well we ought to send them all a bunch of stuff, you know, make sure you leave your address. We're going to send you a bunch of stuff. Turns out JP is, is uh, John Paul, John Paul DeJoria, who is Paul Mitchell. Basically he owns the, so when you're hanging out in the, <laughs> like with your eighties, like hairdo uh, with, with Roger Daltrey, who has the ultimate seventies hairdo and Paul Mitchell's just making your burger medium rare. Well, John Paul DeJoria, but yeah, who, by the way, started Patron and owns Patron as well. <laughs> owns Patron. That's insane. I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, so we're there having a barbecue party at Daltrey's house. We're sitting at the table eating now, and Daltrey pulls a who trick on us. And they came out and they said, just because you guys are here for one day and you know we were there mostly because his daughter was our fan and he knocked on our dressing room door and asked if we would sign his daughter's shit and take a picture with her and we're dying because roger's asking us to do that so we asked roger to take a picture with us and then that led to exchanging of phone numbers which I, i've seen on your mantle you have a little mantle of all of that you should send us that picture so we can post it because it's awesome and by the <laughs> way you had the good george michael thing going on at the time which was really all the all rage right. <clears throat> at the time <laughs> and it was interesting it, it interesting at the house because they made in our honor because we're all boston guys they made a bunch of boston cream pies for dessert and put them <laughs> on the table now when it was time 
they said, okay, let's take some pictures and let's have a video. They, and they had secretly schemed behind our backs and they took the pies and they pied us all in the face. Oh my with God. The pies. They were just bogus. They were just pies with whipped cream on top and, but they weren't really actually pies. They just smashed us all in the face with the pies. Oh uh, my God. That's a, it's a very who thing to do. <clears throat> you know, look, that was an exciting year for us. The second album. I mean, this was the third album, but the second really, you know, big album. And we toured the world and we went back in the studio. Uh, I'd say it was in 19, late 1993 to record our fourth album. And we went back to Florida um, to a place down there that um, was a really famous uh, studio at the time. Um, and we, we all had apartments in, in a condo along the water there in Florida. And what happened was I was recording my drum parts for this fourth album. And one day I had finished my, my tracking and I went into the, this little like sort of kitchen area. And I was having an argument on the phone with the merchandiser. Um, <clears throat> Nuno came in <clears throat> and I'm da, 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 da. You, you fucked us, you know, on the phone going on and <clears throat> I'm sitting on the couch in there after that. And Nuno comes in and that pretty much changed my life. Cause he sat there and he said, you know what, Paul, <clears throat> he goes, I see, you know, how passionate you are on the phone fighting for our rights and the merchandising. He said, um, but I got to tell you, you, you're drumming. He goes, you went in there, you did exactly what you needed to do. You nailed it. He said, it was right on. The meter was good. He goes, I, I wouldn't change anything. It was right on. He goes, but he goes, I don't feel anymore that like urgency and, and excitement to get in there and do it and to change it and to do more things. He said, you went in there, you played it, you aced it, don't get me wrong, but what's what's going on? He goes, you're so passionate in here on the phone and you're making this deal and and thank you for that. He said, but, you know, I really don't know about, you know, all that. You should like think that through. And I went home that night and it, it changed my life because I went home that night and I went, you know what? He's right. I just wanted to get the part done so I could come in here and get on the phone with this guy. <clears throat> and I finished the track and I'm still proud of it. I listened back on that fourth album. It was, in fact, it's probably my favorite of all the albums in terms of the, you know, the natural sounds and what we were doing and the, what I wanted to hear out of my drums. It was all there, but <clears throat> that's when I decided I was, I, I said, you know what? I should be a manager full time because that's is where my passion is. And I'm lying to myself at this point. I mean, and after that time we had been touring and working for eight or nine years, you know, since the, in the eighties when we were like playing and playing and playing to now having gone to the theater level and then arena level and stadium level that I, I decided I was actually going to do that. And my naivety at that age, I mean, I was only still, I don't know what, 30, this was 94, 32, something. Oh my God, I don't know. you did so much before you were 32. That's crazy. Yeah, well, oh I just turned 38 and I learned how to change my oil. <laughs> anyway, no, go on, please. Okay. But this, hey, but Freddie Mercury's really band never called me. So I called the band meeting and I told the guys, look, I want to leave the band, but look, I'm not walking out. Don't get me wrong. Like I'll, I'll finish whatever parts I have to finish. And until you guys get a drummer, someone to fill in, we can work out an arrangement because, you know, I owned a quarter of everything, the trademarks, the songs, it's the way we did it from the beginning. Everybody shared. <clears throat> we never divided anything other than four guys getting a piece, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so we had to work that out, but it was really heavy. Um, <clears throat> Because I'll never forget, you know, so they sat there and we talked it through and we hugged it out. And I remember Gary coming out of the room with me going, are you sure? Are you, are you all right? Is, is this, this not knee jerk? Is it like, you know, and I remember being so sure, like, no, I'm happy. I'm going to be a manager. And I, 
And so I left and it was actually Valentine's Day. It was January, uh, February 14th, 94. I got a ride to the airport. I had my brother-in-law taking my car back to Boston and bringing everything back. I had a home in New Hampshire at the time. And I literally, that was it. I walked out and then I played a few more things like the Boston Music Awards or whatever that they. I saw you. I saw you play with Extreme and it was one of the, the greatest moments of my life because I at was. The music awards? I, I saw uh, not only at the Music Awards, but I saw you at what was Harbor Lights at the time or what have oh, you. Yeah. And um, it was you and then Mike Mangini came back out, who now, as everyone um, who's a geek yeah. might know, plays in Dream Theater, which is really mm-hmm. weird considering that for me. And I'm just going to say this as a fan, and I will tell a quick story about being a fan because when I first met Paul, I met I met him a few times. He signed a band called Reveille, who I actually played with, and he completely ignored me, but signed this other <laughs> band. Whatever, fuck you, Paul. Um, I saw him backstage at Ozfest '99, and I had hold on, classic, just mid sentence, actual guitar with me because I was one of those losers. I was the loser. That brought my guitar backstage, but fortunately I got it signed by everybody. So I go, I go up to Paul and I said, <laughs> Hey Paul, can I have your autograph? And like he looks around like, you must be mistaking me for somebody else. And I'm like, No, are you Paul Geary? He's like, God smacks over there. I'm like, No, I want your autograph. And the first thing oh, is Well, it was a Godsmack concert. <laughs> well, and you had said to me, you go, How old are you, kid? But I think, um, I think uh hold on. It's yeah, it's I right thought you were too young to know us. Yeah, but right but right right here. Right here, we have the Paul oh, Gear. Wow. Yeah, so for the listeners that aren't watching the video, Ben is holding up a guitar. Hold on, and, 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 and just so you understand how important it is, I have my star set backstage pass here. So oh, I, yeah. just so if I'm uh, ready for the band, I have my picture of Jeff Hanneman, who passed away from that day wearing a uh, shirt that says fuck you, you fucking fuck. And then my friend's <laughs> memorial. So this is a very important guitar for me, but this was the day that Paul Geary questioned my love for Extreme. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember a slightly different version in where you came up and asked me for my autograph backstage at a Godsmack concert, and I was their manager, and I thought, you must have mistaken me for someone in Godsmack, because I wasn't that. And, and then you set me straight. Yes. Wow. You're no, way too that's, nice. That's, but that that's really incredible and, and bold, and it, it makes me wonder, so... You know, did it take any time for you to to really think about that move from not you, Ben, to move from, you know, being a musician to being a manager? Were you already kind of immersed in the management side or was it just kind of like a gut feeling where you kind of knew that that was the direction you had to go in and then just take a leap? Well, I had been immersed in the management side, but I'd never managed a band outside of my own. So that was a big leap. And I felt like I wouldn't have been taken seriously as much if I was the drummer of extreme managing bands like, you know, and so it did take a couple of years. You know, I I left and I was saying like in my naivety, I thought I had enough dough because when you're you're younger like that, plus, you know, have a Ferrari and a big house. And And you bought your mom a house because you're that guy. Yeah, I came a little bit later, but. The point was that I had a big overhead and I spent a couple of years looking, you know, for that act, you know, to manage and figure out who that was going to be. And um, and Sully was a friend of mine and was hanging out at my house all the time. And we would drink and smoke pot and play video games. And he would pump me, pump me and pump me for like, how does this work? And how do you do that? And what's it? Cause he, he was a extreme fan and he used to come with me once in a while to some of the dates and uh, we'd hang out and he, he just loved all that. And he was learning. He was a quick study and he was learning about all of it. And he brought me some, some music at the time before Godsmack and it was really more metal ish. Um, and you know, I instinctively knew back then that that's not the road I wanted to go down because I needed to have some real commercial success, like early on in my management career, if I was going to like be in the, the, the Gulf stream of, of, or the, if that's the right word of, of, uh, the vacuum of extreme and who was still popular at the time. And I was <clears throat> of just a recent form of him. Anyway, 
uh, finally, I went out to see Sully's band a few times. It wasn't Godsmack yet, but it was the three of the four players. And he began to bring me music, you know, and that music that he brought me uh, turned out to be eventually a, a great deal part of the first Godsmack album. And I went to see him in a, in a club a few times playing. They were still, you know, making a few hundred bucks playing in clubs. And I really saw, what I really saw was a connection between the way the people were receiving the music and that the band was playing it. Sully was now singing, which I had no, he was been a drummer up until that point. <clears throat> now he was singing and it was really rough and tumble. It was working, you know, and it was right on the tail end of like, at that point, <clears throat> we're talking about 96, 97, like in there. <clears throat> and anyway, <clears throat> I signed the band and we, we, went and, you know, similar to the old trademark thing you guys are talking about, we documented it. We, we did a full-blown management agreement. Um, and, the, and at that time, I spent, I don't know, six or seven months trying to get it a record deal. And I was taking it to my best relationships, like to the president of Universal, brought it back to A&M. At that time, even Epic and you know, there were more labels back then and <clears throat> nobody would sign it. They all said, Paul, this is a great record, but you just missed it. He said, this is Metallica, Alice in Chains. And right now what's coming in and happening is Rage, Limp Biscuit. You know, it was rap rock, 311, like all that shit was coming on. And they, they were saying, you just missed it. But I'm going, but... I didn't miss it because people are reacting. There's still a gazillion Metallica and Alice in Chains fans and all the fans of like true grit rock and roll like this is. And anyway, so what we did was there were three major players that are often forgotten that were really the impetus for this all coming together. Let's just start with Sully put together an amazing record. You know, it all starts there. That record was awesome, that first album. <clears throat> but a few, since we couldn't get a deal, and AAF, Sully had a relationship there. Can I, can I tell you that I remember one yeah. night, and maybe this is what you're alluding yeah. to, listening to sure. Rocco. <clears throat> yes. And Rocco came on and said, hey, there's this guy, Bruce Mittman. He's probably going to be mad at me, but I'm going to play this song. And there was maybe like 74 fucks in it. Um, and I think he played it five or six times in the night. And I remember listening to him on the radio going, huh, this guy's going to get in trouble, but this is cool. And uh, they had actually, I was going to media play to get my music at the time, which was at a mall that doesn't even matter anymore or even exist. And they had <laughs> stuck a CD single to the original cover of the, of the album. Well, that came later. That was my idea. It okay, came yeah. Well, I saw, I don't know if I'm crossing my wires, but I remember listening to Rocco and he, did he play their song a bunch of times in a night? <laughs> yeah, well, what happened was Rocco was a fan of the band and he was a friend of Sully's and he was the first guy to ever play the band on the radio. But he was a DJ, not a program director or a general manager. So what he did was <clears throat> he played the song Keep Away which was in the original local record <clears throat> at night. <clears throat> um, that was around the time that I had just started managing the band. <clears throat> he was playing it at night, but they, the difference is that he didn't have the power to add it. In other words, to get it in rotation. You know, he wasn't supposed to put it on. He was supposed to put on what they told him to put on. Like he was just to talk. Right. And what happened was <clears throat> uh, all of my closest friends locally rallied around us. One was Bob Duteau from the Don Law Company. <clears throat> he agreed to come on and be the band's agent. So what he did for, for us and for me <clears throat> was that whenever a major act came through town with Don Law that didn't have an opening act, he was plugging Godsmack in for us <clears throat> um, and giving us a little bit more 
cred locally and getting us way more money than we had been getting before. <laughs> then an old friend of mine, Ron Valeri, who was the program director of AAF and wasn't at the time, but he came back. And when he came back, he became the program director and he was, he was the guy that was able to do it. <clears throat> and what he told me when I played the album, I gave him the album, I worked him. He told me, look, I think this new song, whatever was the name of the song <clears throat> is could be the strongest single on the album. And, but it wasn't on the album. <clears throat> so we, <clears throat> we made a deal and we said, look, <clears throat> we will strip it on. We'll, we'll add, we'll, we'll make a CD single and we'll strip it to the album. <clears throat> and then the next guy that came in was Michael Dries, who owned Newberry Comics. Michael, by the, by the way, one guy that's Scott Benson, who runs this whole thing, who's our sponsor, has yes. been saying, you have to get Mike on the show. You have to get Mike on the show. You have to get Mike on the show. And he keeps trying to sell me as if I didn't see him at Loco Bazooka on the pa the panels, which, by the way, Loco Bazooka was a giant festival that was very ahead of its time in that you could pay to play with big bands and see guys like Mike talk on a stage about what it takes to do what you're doing. Sorry, continue. Yeah, on a local level. And what Sully had already done to his credit and through an, a girl who worked in the offices at, at uh, Newberry Comics, he had gotten the, the Godsmack local record in the consignment bins with the other local bands. And so he had Rocco playing it at night, the song Keep Away. He he had already managed to get it into Newberry Comics, but it was in the local bin where you basically give them records. And if they sell, they pay you your share. Um, mm -hmm. But then when I came in, Ron Valeri, he took the song, whatever, and he put it in rotation. So he was the first guy to add it, which meant for the first time it was being reported nationally on the network as as a song that was being played in rotation mike drees helped move it from the consignment bin and to put it in the regular sound scanning you know bins with all the major records so we got it moved from there to there and we got it added and so now we're going from selling 50 records a week to selling a hundred records a week. And then I would run with the sound scan over to the radio station, say, look, we sold twice as many records this week. He, yeah, you did. And, they, and Ron just had them every DJ now throughout the day playing the song, whatever. So it was getting played then, you know, four or five times a day. And all the, the time. All yes, the time. And, and the retail was picking it up and we still didn't have a record deal, but now we began to chart because we were now being reported to SoundScan, selling at Newberry Comics, and our sales were going to 200, 300, 4, 5, 600. By the time actually a and not a and uh, Universal signed us, we were selling 1,000 records a week through the chain of 23 stores or so. Um, and we were the number one selling record in Newberry Comics. And that changed everything. Now, and now Universal, who six months before had sort of liked it, was dancing around us, but never pulled the trigger. They just didn't sign the band. They weren't sure. And then once this happened, they were sure they made the deal. And when that deal happened, it changed everything because now Universal actually took that record. They didn't even bother to, to have the band re-record. What we did was we remastered the album. We added whatever to it. We did a new album cover uh, and we got the credits in place. And then Universal took it and expanded the, the distribution around the country. And, you know, the rest is history. We sold 5 million copies of that album. And it was the first album that I, um, I think that was officially under my watch um, of my management company and it changed everything because now, you know, that album cycle lasted like a couple of years at least. And we were touring on a, on a, and growing like crazy. And that gave me the way with all to start signing other bands. 
And that's how my management company really got off the ground because now I had a, an arena headline arena level act on my roster. And then I, the next thing I signed the band fuel out of Pennsylvania and they were hot and had some hit records and, but they were broke already. They were already a big band and they fired their manager and came to me and you know, that just went on and on over 2002, three, four, five multi-platinum records, one after the next. I mean, we had sold maybe, I don't know, by that time, 10 or 11 million copies of the, of the records in total. And then in 2005, a wild thing happened. I was, I had my offices in Medford, Mass, and it was, inexpensive to run and I had eight employees and I was doing great. I had a roster of bands. I had hit records from three or four different acts and I got a call uh, from Irving Azoff and nobody from a nobody. Yeah. And, but and you, know, do you tell her, listen, I remember being with Alex Bach and he said, I'm going to go hang out with this guy. And Alex is our, our friend, um, Ernie's son. He's yeah. like, oh yeah, we're going to the Eagles concert. I was going with John Garabedian. And so I already felt cool because we'll get into how cool <laughs> John Garabedian is. And by the way, he sends his love. He misses you. We just talked to him the other night. Yeah, we just interviewed and him a couple we'll, nights ago. We'll get into that. Um, oh, that guy. But, yeah, but I, I tell John as we're going to the Eagles, Alex doesn't know who Irving Azoff is, but that's who he's going to go meet up with. And, and he literally made me call Alex back and say, you should go on Wikipedia and look at Irving Azoff. Like, you can't, there's no way that you should go out to the Eagles concert to not be aware of who you're, and like, he's like, okay, okay. And he's like at the show <laughs> and then like realizes that Irving Azoff is like the emperor. And when he comes in, like all the smoke clears and walks yeah. through and well, then like Joe Walsh hands him a hamburger and says, life's been good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, look, Irving, there's no question. I mean, the guy, at the time, he didn't even have reached his plateau, and he was already the most successful music guy in the business anywhere. I mean, he was at the top. And he called me, and, you know, I'll try and make it a shorter story than it is, but ultimately he invited me to lunch. I went to lunch with him. He said, look, I know there's another big company out here courting you, but don't make that deal. Just sit back. I'm about to make a giant deal and it's going to have something in it for you. And I'm going to want you to come out to LA, bring your, you can bring your staff, you can bring your ax and you'll be right across the hall from me and we'll work together because, and he explained to me at that meeting why I should give him 50% of my company. And at the time I thought, wow, this is Irving Azoff. But, is this the original Shark Tank? But I was, yeah, right. But no, I'm right. serious. It's like it's like it's yeah, like maybe. the emperor coming and saying, "Listen, yeah, Anakin, right. I could turn you into Darth Vader, and you can do all these crazy things." But at the end of the day, I'm the Sith Master. Well, I asked leader. him. I said, "Well, you want me to give up 50 percent of my company?" He said, "Look, Paul. He goes, here's what it comes down to: you can keep 100 percent of your grape, or you can have 50 percent of a watermelon." <laughs> and he said, <laughs> "That's what he said," <clears throat> and I bought it. And <laughs> I bought it. Was and it true though? Was it a watermelon? He was, right. he was right because I began to make, you know, multiple times, you know, the money that I had been making on my 50%. But because I wasn't with him within a year, we had, you know, we, well, look, at the time he was on this big grand scheme to, first of all, create the biggest artist management company in the world, which he did do by guy, buying guys like me. And then he ended up out buying about 20 guys like me, bigger guys, um, and started. And at the point that he peaked in the management company, we had 240 artists, all of which you knew. I mean, they, they were all wow. like it was the Eagles, Aerosmith, Boston, Van Halen, uh, Christina Aguilera. Um, we had uh, Miley Cyrus when she was before Miley. Uh, Hannah Montana. Hannah Montana. Yeah, yeah. TV show that was all being run out of our, our company. And so for about two years, I was across the hall from him 
and he just kept bringing me acts and, and we had, you know, I ended up managing the smashing pumpkins, the return when they were like just the first time coming back after seven or eight years. And it was a big money act. And, and I ended up signing the, the scorpions and um, my, and a bunch of other acts. So what happened was at the point we hit our peak, Live Nation and Ticketmaster were in a battle. And the battle was that um, the arenas were beginning to run out of their contracts to have Ticketmaster be their ticketing system. And Live Nation, uh, the arenas were going to start their own ticketing system. I think it was called Next Ticket or whatever it was at the time. So they were in a battle because Ticketmaster didn't want to lower their rates. And Live Nation said, we're going to start our own company and not use you anymore. So Irving, um, you know, I don't know all the details, but I can tell you this, that Irving got in and he brokered a deal between Live Nation and Ticketmaster. And the deal was that it, at the end of the day, that they were going to merge and become the same company so that there would be nothing to fight about because now they had the ticketing system and they had all the venues and they had the, and they were the biggest promoter in the world. And what, that was the first move that went down and Irving said, yeah, but I got to be CEO of both companies because that's the only way that we can do this and make it work. So I'm watching this thing go down. And I mean, it's on C-SPAN and Irving's, testifying between the department to the par department of justice on why this isn't a monopoly. Like he has to get the department of justice to sign off on it because they're saying you're going to be too big. Cause by that time, after he became the CEO of those two companies, he bought his management company frontline <clears throat> with those companies took the dough <clears throat> And made it one giant company called Frontline Entertainment. Oh, no, Live Nation Entertainment. That's what it was, Live Nation. By that time, I had my, he gave, gave me my own division, which we called AGP, which was Azoff, Geary, and Paul, Jared Paul, which was the third part. And we had a division of the company that included, you know, now I was overseeing, you know, 14 employees with Jared, and we had... Earth, Wind and Fire, Jennifer Hudson, the reformation of New Kids on the Block. We had the Scorpions. We had Godsmack. We had Smashing Pumpkins. Um, we had the touring production of Dancing with the Stars that we were doing in theaters. Like, I mean, it was, uh, and I'm forgetting, you know, other. What were your, what were your text messages like at three o'clock in the morning? <laughs> uh, you know what, dude? I was out of my mind for like eight years. Can I tell you what, a text message I remember getting? I remember I was DJing at a place called The Place in Boston, which was a really, really shitty club where people, like a meat market um, it, down, in, down in Faneuil Hall. Doesn't exist anymore. Surprising. Um, no, it's, uh, it, it was, it was uh, uh, fun. And I remember getting a text message saying, Nuno is with Bieber. Where are they supposed to go in Boston right now? And I... Oh. I thought and I, you have a t tip for me. No, no tip, no tip. But like, I'm like, is this what you have to do? Like, like literally Nuno's on the phone with you, like as a manager, like, Hey man, I think I might want to get into that Bieber band thing because he's huge, but like we're in Boston and I'm trying to show him something cool in Boston. We can't do anything fun. What is there to do? Then Paul's like, I'm going to solve this problem. I'll text Ben. He works at some meat market or some shit. What's going on? And I'm like, tell them to go home. There's nothing to do. And that's what I texted you. <laughs> and I was really regretful because I should have said, tell them to come back to my place. Should've we'll lied. have a great time. <laughs> should have just lied. I should have lied. I did it though. Cause you want to, you're my friend. I don't want to tell him it's better than it is. Cause then it's my fault. I have the onus to Bieber when Nuno yeah. lets him down. No, and you don't want to be on Nuno's bad side. Trust me, Paul. Yeah. Those, those days were, were nutty. And <laughs> I, I was out of my mind. But I was making more money than I ever made in my life, you know, during those years. And those years lasted from late 2005 when I moved to L.A. to join him to January 2013 when he resigned from the whole conglomerate. And when he did that, 
it, it all broke up from I mean, frontline went in all different directions. All the managers went to independent and I opened up my own place in LA. And that's when I signed uh, Billy Ray Cyrus and produced that TV show we had on um, country music television called Still the King. We had two seasons of that. And that was my, t- my first foray into successful TV. Um, we did well on that. We got paid well. Do you remember that Corey and I were together in California and we took your Jaguar, Corey, like it was all like literally all hunched up backseat. And you're yeah. like, Hey, it's not mastered oh, yeah. yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here, listen to the new uh, Billy Ray Cyrus record. It's really cool. And by the way, Joe Perry's on it. And we're like, this is, I'm like, this is great. This sounds awesome. The sound stage is awesome. And Corey's like, yeah, five yeah, foot man. two Ben's in the front seat with a thing all the way back. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're right. Well, it was a two seater for Christ's sake. Yeah, right. <laughs> you You're know? lucky you got a ride, man. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, that period, that was an exciting period for me because that was a period in which I signed Joe Perry and then I introduced Joe Perry to Billy Ray because they were fans of each other. And that led to sort of playing together at, at Billy Ray's house and hanging out and all that shit. I love uh, Cohen, but when you were managing Billy Ray, and I'm sorry if this is oversharing. Um, and, and Corey can cut it out if you decide you want to. But I remember <laughs> there were days like I was hanging out with you and you know, when you hang out with someone as entre- entrepreneurial as you, first off, you have to be available like a doctor, like a Billy Ray or Joe Perry, or we will let, we'll get into some of the other people that, um, you know, you represent. If they have a problem and want to talk, it doesn't matter if you're on fire, you have to like <laughs> handle it. And so I know sometimes, even if I'm doing something with you that like, if you have to go into work mode, like that's fine. And I remember you being like, Billy Ray didn't smoke the right type of weed today. It's going to be a bad day. <laughs> and like just living vicariously through your good and bad days with this guy. Like He went to the wigwam out back with Miley today. It <laughs> seems like things are going well, but I'm not sure yet. I, I, I don't know if he's going to make up with our friend uh, Ernie because they were like, I don't know, whatever. But like it was just hilarious because you literally like, I don't know. Who I'm gonna get today? And I, but you had a successful television show. You're representing this huge dude. Meanwhile, Miley's oh. going and doing the craziest stuff of, of her career. Um, what was that like, dude? And and by the way, you left right before he had the biggest song of the year. I'm like, oh, he's never gonna have a hit. And then Lil Nas and freaking <laughs> Billy Ray Cyrus had the most ridiculously, and I'm gonna say it's stupid song I've ever heard for basic people, but God bless them for making the basic song that's the basic anthem for basic yeah, look, people Billy for a Ray's basic one of year. Those guys, you can't ever count that guy out. No! I mean, there's always something. If it, you know, he went from- Don't break my heart, but, Paul. Uh, anyway, you know, it's interesting to say about that. You know, the tricky part about these acts, especially when you have a lot of them, is you got to learn how to manage them because each guy is different. Like, you know, with Billy Ray, you know, you're best to have your phone calls before noon. You get them in the morning. You know what I mean? And then he was clear and on it. And he was great. Great to deal with. Really good guy. Still love him today. Still communicate with him all the time. Really good guy. Uh, you know, other guys, you got to get them at two o'clock in the morning. That's the way it was with like Joe or Johnny Depp. You know, I, I have to go over Johnny's house. Can we, like, hold on, you just I, glossed <laughs> over that. So I remember at one point we drove across, uh, well, we drove from LA to San Diego and you had, I don't know what your scheme was for some other company, but you're like, Ben, I'm not sure I can do this managing thing anymore. It's kind of going the way of the dodo. And I'm like, are you sure? You're kind of the best at this of anyone I know. Like, yeah, man. The next thing I know, you're signing Joe Perry. And then I get a call one day. Yo, man, it's official. You didn't say yo, man, but it's <laughs> official. Johnny Depp, he's got an act acting uh, guy. But for his music career, I'm his manager. And as far as I'm concerned, you Johnny Depp transcends space and time because it's not just about being a, a, a musician because Johnny Depp is not just a musician despite the fact that he did that before all the shenanigans. Um, but he's a cultural icon that like even when Joe Perry's in the room, he could be overshadowed. What was that yeah, like? I mean, that that was actually in embarrassing at times you know i've been in there with you know we once you know we had the hollywood vampires on tour and for people who don't know that it it has alice cooper joe perry and johnny depp and we would have these you know a meet and greets where 
we had to figure it out because there'd be, you know, a hundred people would that bought a meet and greet to meet the guys and girls would come in and basically like push by Alice and Joe to get to Johnny. (laughs) They weren't, they didn't like it. They didn't even exist. So, and we had to change around the way those things were done. So if you put Johnny first, then they'd get their picture or they're doing whatever. And they, then they'd move down the line and then we did meet Joe or Alice. But you can see in the pictures where they all get together, look like that the women were just like, they were like on him, you know, <laughs> and he was embarrassed because he's on Joe Perry. He's like, Oh my God, Joe Perry. Paul, I get to play with Joe Perry. This is the most crazy thing ever. I mean, he used to always say, I, I still can't believe they let me play with him. Uh, because Joe Perry's Joe fucking Perry, you know, and, and Alice. Sure. Perry. No, that's actually trademarked. It's Joe fucking Perry. It literally is Joe fucking Perry. Joe fucking Perry, right? <laughs> and yeah, no, that was a trip, and <laughs> it's still a trip that the people you meet through him, because that's a whole other world. I mean, I remember one night, uh, because I, I had to learn with Johnny, like, because I I'm a normal kind of guy in terms that you know I may get. Are up, you? But look, dude, I'll get up at eight in the morning and I'll crash at midnight or one o'clock, maybe two o'clock. Johnny will sleep until two or three and then be up all night recording, writing, doing whatever he does. And he crashes at 6 a.m. or seven or whatever it is. Right. So trying to work with the guy, it wasn't working like I'd be coming down the studio at, or at his house, like at, at six or seven o'clock and he's just sort of getting to the work and it's, and there's too many people around engineer and this guy and the other players and they're, they're all in there and you can't do it. So I learned that I, what I would have to do is adopt that for a little bit, stay up most of the night and then get a day sleep and then go to his house at one o'clock in the morning or midnight. So basically and, you had to be a Hollywood vampire to catch the yes. vampire. Yep. Yeah, the Hollywood like vampire. Chameleon. You have to really no, adapt it, to that. The- and then and then two o'clock in the morning, he'd get up on the table, like get at the table in the studio, and you'd wrap for three hours and you get everything done. Cause he was on it. He was like, you know, to him it was four o'clock, you know, in the afternoon. Yeah. You know what I mean? So and the people that would show up, I mean, um, <clears throat> Siobhan, you're a little young for some of these, but like one night I am sitting in the studio, me, Joe Perry, uh, Johnny Depp, and maybe the engineer was sitting there. So I'm already going, what a trip it is of all time, hanging out with Joe Perry and Johnny Depp. Like they're already like this. And we're sitting up, you know, having a drink and smoking and talking and it's going on. And suddenly Jeff Beck walks in the room oh with another friend of ours, a photographer, and I'm like, what the fuck? And so then Jeff Beck sits down and Joe and Johnny are like on him, like, oh, Jeff, what? You know, like, and I'm going, now I'm sitting here with Jeff Beck, Johnny Depp, and Joe Perry <laughs> at the table, you know, doing what we were doing. And those kind of wild moments, like, I mean, I remember. But hold on, of all those guys who had the longest scarf. Uh, that's pretty funny. Now we were saying we were saying this when I talked to uh, Ernie that when I go out to all these events with all you guys, the guy who has the hierarchy, like you know, is the guy with the longest scarf. And when we were backstage at the Hendrix Experience, you had Dave Mustaine. They all wear the John Barbados. You know this. You have John Barbados. Everything. They all wear the John Barbados. And then Ernie has a scarf. Dave Mustaine had a scarf. <laughs> I think Billy Cox backstage had a scarf. And then all of a sudden, Kenny Arnoff shows up with this long, giant red scarf that literally flowed behind him. Yeah. Well, so look, I, let's face it. Tyler and Perry started that shit. You know, no, they like, did. Uh, That's why I'm wondering if Jeff right. Beck and Johnny Depp and Joe Perry are in a room who has the longest scarf. Yeah. Well, you'll never catch probably Johnny and Joe not looking cool. Like, I can tell you stories about that. I mean, I picked up Joe Perry to at about... I don't know, midnight at Johnny's house to drive to Vegas together because we were playing a show there. And he comes out of the house and he's fucking Joe Perry. He's got the whole, you know, chains and 
boots and fucking like looking as cool as like that he could walk on stage right at that moment. And I'm like, dude, like we're driving in this van in the back of the one of those, <laughs> like type of vans to Vegas. And you like, don't you ever like, you know what? The, he goes, Paul, he goes, it's the day of no secrets, social media. We will get out of the van at six o'clock in the morning. You know, someone will be there snapping pictures. And he goes, and I'll be in pajamas and the fucking like <laughs> whatever. So we go, uh, and I'm like, wow, that's a trip. Like, um, this is sort of a, a off topic a little bit, but it's it's that topic. And the first time I went and I, I crashed at Joe Perry's house in Massachusetts, which was another trip for me. You know, I grew up on Aerosmith. I told you the earlier stories, how it all happened was Aerosmith, like showing me the way. And here I am managing Joe Perry. And I was at his home and we were flying to New York together the next day on a helicopter from Massachusetts. And so he goes, hey, so let's, you know, meet for breakfast about nine o'clock and then we'll head for the thing. And I said, okay. So in the morning I get up, I take a shower, I go into the kitchen and there's Joe cooking eggs at nine o'clock and he's totally Joe Perry. Like he's got no shirt on, but like he's got all his chains <laughs> on and his uh, shit and his, and he's, you know, the, the pants that are, you know, leather cut and open. And I'm going, if, do you ever walk, wake up and look in the mirror and say, fuck, I'm Joe Perry. Like, like, I'm like, well, I'm going to figure that out. Well, you just laugh, you know, but I can't believe guys like him. Um, Johnny's kind of like that, but nobody's more like that than, than Joe. Joe lives it. He wakes up and he's. Well, can I tell you that you gave me an opportunity to watch them both do that to each other? Because I got a backstage pass to the Hollywood Vampires because I know somebody. And uh, they're very, very strict, by the way. Um, and I'm sitting there, and obviously the band's playing because they don't need the singers or whatever at the time. Johnny and Joe are still in the back getting fluffed, doing whatever Joe and Johnny do. <laughs> and they're playing, and then they both waltz out. And first off, they look. From head to toe, I mean, this is for sound check. Nobody swagger like Johnny's <laughs> hair is all like. This is when Johnny had his hair head all shaved. I'm like, what the fuck is going on with this guy? Joe Perry's got like medallions and like crazy chains and all that. But what was crazy about it? They walk out with their wirelessness and they're both smoking cigars. <laughs> and this is before Joe Perry and all that stuff. But they're both smoking cigars and. No, they hadn't done, they had just started to do changes where Johnny Depp sings, but no one like had known this yet. This was the first tour and they come out and it's literally Johnny and Joe. And I'm on the side of the stage watching them from here, just trying to sing, play guitar, have their scarves, like all their jewelry look cool with the guitars, their Duesenbergs and Gibsons and smoke and see who could like puff naturally the most amount of smoke at the same time. And all you could see was just this. I don't know how they do that. Jo it's jo un fucking believable. I have it on tape. I was like, but they're looking at each other like, who can do the most smoke to attract the most chicks backstage? Uh, I don't think that's a worry. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. Oh my God. You know, anyway, so we went through the Azov period and then, you know, Azov left. I started signing other bands. Um, actually, Ernie, you know, I got to say, Ernie pulled me, our friend Ernie Bach. Ernie uh, Bach Jr. Yes. He really helped me through that period of time after Irving left. And I wasn't sure what exactly was the next move. And I took a few artists with me. One was the uh, Steel Panther, who was like a club band at the time. We just talked to Satchel. Yeah, we talked to Satchel last And we night. love him. So there's He's that. The best. We love Steel Panther. He lives here in Vegas now. Yeah, Makes so he, sense. He, comes, he comes here and hangs, which you guys should well, do. Oh, well, <clears throat> listen, when all this COVID craziness, first off, Cindy has never <laughs> been to Vegas. Um, <laughs> so there's that. And then secondly, like you keep telling me how awesome your house is. And like every time I've gone like to one of your places, you've upgraded. You went from like this, um, you know, bachelor pad on the Hollywood strip that was like Obviously, for Hollywood, where every square square inch is like $2 million a month, you have this pretty <laughs> spectacular place. And then you got this awesome place in like Sherman Oaks, like right down from like Charlie Manson. 
and all the crazy people. And it's beautiful. It's like beautiful, but like obviously you like you look around, you're like all these people are like gajillionaires. And now you're in Vegas. And I gotta tell you, I I, I cannot wait to see. Oh yeah, dude. I, what you've honest, done I, with I, Vegas, I've never, Paul. I've never owned a, <laughs> in a house as as fantastic as this is. So jumping back in. Um, we had John Garabedian on the other night, who is one of the greatest interviewers ever, and he interviews people completely differently than I do, where he actually listens to them, lets them speak mostly, <laughs> is selfless, asks what people want to hear, has no egocentrism, avoids any narcissistic tendencies, um, <laughs> and has even agreed that if Corey and I forgo talking, that he'll even come back on our show and interview other people so that we can watch and take notes. So uh, uh, we're going to have a, sh a show called Shajon, where it's Siobhan, but with John. I don't even know why I need to be in that. Yeah, the open house party with Shajon. But <laughs> what we made John do was we made John interview Siobhan because unlike Corey and myself, who's still making barely the hundreds, maybe the tens, the Hamiltons <laughs> um, at the clubs that aren't <laughs> open right now for the COVIDs, um, Siobhan has 2 billion streams with her band. Siobhan's played with Michael Buble and Andrea Bocelli and Trans-Siberian Orchestra. She's on the show that you're watching right now. That's the number one show, I believe, in the world. It doesn't and mean I'm making any she money. Has, John Garabedian <laughs> has agreed to be not my co-host, not Corey's co-host. So what, what I'd like you to do is imagine you've agreed to manage Siobhan. What does that meeting sound like, Paul? Well, it starts by wanting to know what her goals are. <clears throat> because a lot of people, um, you would be surprised, <clears throat> have different ideals, like you know what, what they want to do with their life and their career. Some people want to create balance in their life and look, I don't want to tour like crazy, crazy so hold tour. On. Let's let this is let's well, let, no, let, let it keep yeah. going because this should well, be is let this, it be is general. This, is this your spiel? Is this the actual spiel or is this just telling us what it's like? Because I want this to be imagine we're not here. We're just we're just well, there's no the spiel. I mean, the truth of the matter is you can't you have to start knowing what the what the artist wants. I mean, they, they're not interested in, in what I want. They're interested in what they want and what they're hoping for and what they've done to date and what tools do we have to work with? What's their history? You know, like I got to learn a lot first um, about the person and the personality and how they want to be managed. Some artists just want to make decisions and they want somebody to go get that done for them. You know, other artists want to be guided and told what they should do. You know, um, you know, and some people change over their career. They start off like just whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And, and you guide them. And almost invariably, when they get to some level of success, they start seeing things differently and saying, ah, oh, you know, well, you know, if it were me, I, I don't want to tour this much anymore. I want to tour domestically. I don't so, want to. So tour what do you want, Siobhan? Well, that's that. I mean, this is interesting to me, though, because I might be I think I'm in a different category from probably a lot of the people that you manage because I don't necessarily have one singular product. So probably what you look for as a manager is somebody that has a product that you can, you know, help them with. You know, for me, I'm a violinist and I'm a player. Right. And I do a lot of different things. I don't have a solo album. I don't have one thing that I own. So I probably fall into the category of somebody that doesn't know exactly what I want yet and needs somebody to tell me what to do. So that's interesting because I think it on the yeah. management side. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, that so that's well, interesting. Yeah, well, there's that. There's also just getting to the to the bottom of like what to do to do what. Like what so the so the idea is, yeah, what like uh, you may lay out your vision and like then someone like me or my team can get together and deliver uh, a step program to get there you know whatever that mm -hmm. may be and uh th that's just a lot of variables and i've never managed two artists frankly that were the same mm -hmm. everyone has a different idea about what they want to do and how they want to do it and also what kind of 
you know, what style of music do you want to play if you're a musician, you know, because that's going to, you know, frame the, a, a different path. Well, we just found out that John Garabedian's willing to have a show and revive his, his interviewing services with Siobhan. I mean, I would love to do that myself, but he doesn't seem to like me very much, but he, uh, he finds, I think he used the word fascinating yeah. for Siobhan. Uh, so, so what would you suggest that she do? I mean, considering that we're the I chopped liver. That we all get together in Norwood in a couple weeks. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm down. I'll get to Ernie's. Uh, where do you live in, Siobhan? I, I'm kind of between, I live a lot of the time in Miami, Florida, and then I'm in Ohio too. So I'm kind of oh. right now, currently in Ohio. She's but, a rock star. She's all well, over. Yeah, but I mean, even the rock stars aren't really traveling much. <laughs> Yeah, so, no, it's all, it's all, but no, yeah. but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to travel totally, but I mean, you know, it's interesting because, so a question for you is of, of people that you manage or have managed, have they all been people that have had original music or do you take on people that are, let's say just performers or artists that, that don't necessarily own a product that are interested have, in being managed in terms of their career as a performer? You know, I have a lot of relationships with people who do that, but I've never managed one because frankly, for me, um, I, it's just, there's a ceiling on that. I, I think, you know, like mm -hmm. it, unless you're um, trying to carve out something that leads to Siobhan, you, you know, yeah. like, at the end of the day, because that, that's what I do. And beyond that, to be honest, I've changed over the years because when I was younger, you know, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And then I wanted to go into management and then I wanted to manage as many bands as I could because I wanted to have the biggest company and be the most successful manager. And it was all that. And then it led to, oh, you know what? I don't want that now that I'm there. Like I want to manage a few greats, mm -hmm. you know, like I just want to manage three or four. Like Johnny artists. Depp and Joe Perry. Correct. I mean, yeah, how much bigger? I could only show you. I could show you one picture I got today in the mail that's actually bigger than that. Only one I've ever seen. <laughs> well, I mean, to Benny's point, so it, about me, you know, I'm somebody that's kind of probably in process. Eventually, I would love to have something that's my own thing. But back to Benny. <laughs> so, how do you get bigger than Joe Perry and Johnny Depp, <clears throat> Al Pacino, and Johnny oh. Depp? We get Al a fucking guitar, but not even get, like get him a guitar. Have him come out, uh, do a what? fucking song. <laughs> Al Pacino will do the Donny Brasco. I know, I got it signed. It literally, because because you won't get me Johnny Depp's autograph because even though I know you and you manage him, you still haven't sent me one. I had to buy it from eBay officially. Ah, uh, that's funny. Is that is that? It's Al uh, Donny Brasco. Yeah, Donny Brasco. Ah, uh, I know. Cool. That's your guy, man. That's yeah. your guy. Without uh, Pacino, who should have a guitar, and I'm telling you, like when you guys see him with Alice Cooper doing "Schools Out," why can't that happen? Paul, you are a big thinker. One never knows. <laughs> yeah. Right. That said, listen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we had a sidebar conversation that we had to edit out because, like, we're talking about personal things because, it, oh, yeah. in all actuality, Paul is a good friend of ours, and I have to first off say thank you because. Even over a decade ago, I, I cold called your office and I joke around about this because like then everyone's going to try cold calling you or something. But you actually spent like an hour and a half on the phone with my brother and I telling us, convincing us, one, that we would never want you to manage us anyway. Two, that you didn't know what a, what a, a number one single sounds like. And even when you've told people that they were going to be number one singles, that you were always wrong. And that three, that the worst thing that could ever happen if you only have $100,000 is that you could get a number one single because good luck, you can't continue that. There's just no way. And four, pretty much give up everything. There's no chance. And I got to tell you, it was one of, the most, one of the most honest conversations which, <laughs> that I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because still I said, all right, fuck that guy. I'm still going to prove him wrong. But it was so real and he didn't have to, I didn't know him. We had, he had no reason to talk to me, but I basically found out like his number at his office and cold called him. I arranged a meeting with his secretary and he actually talked to my brother and I about our album we spent $25,000 on that did absolutely nothing. So <laughs> for that, Paul, I thank you. You're a gentleman and a scholar. And, and, and 
as they say in Yiddish, you're a mensch. Uh, they do say that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, for everyone listening, this was an amazing episode. Check out part one. Also, I just like so much value and stories and you're an incredible person. So thank you for taking the time to hang out with the three of us. <laughs> As are you. And I'm going to go watch, um, you know, the Queen's uh, Gambit. Sure. <laughs> And I'll go yeah, watch the Queen concert. Yeah, so we'll we we'll both catch up on each other. We'll, we'll all get together. Well, but we have to actually have an episode. Paul, will you come back and talk to us? Because I feel like we, because you're going to, you're going to have your mind blown with the Queen's Gambit because I watched that. And I was like, all right, whatever. And it's kind of like acid where at first you're like, oh, and the next thing you know, you're like staring at your It's fucking, very addictive. I will yeah. agree. And then, and then with the Queen concert, it's some of the best harmonies ever done live in front hey. of 95,000 slash 1 billion people. And talk about the, the energy of the audience being cathartically filtered live through a band. You guys were like a conduit to Freddie Mercury and the heavens above. So just that alone, nevertheless, all the stories I know in my head, we haven't even scratched the surface with Paul Geary. Will you come back, please, sir? Oh, of course. For anything, Siobhan, if anything. Yeah, anything for, <laughs> anything for Siobhan. Oh, thank you. Well, you <laughs> guys know your homework. And with that said, you've been 2020. Our evolution as musicians happened behind closed doors, okay? There was no need to post a video and this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. Whereas kids these days, that's what you do. You know, my generation, our generation, evolved quite differently. So when I, when I came out of the gate, you know, with my first couple records, it was kind of like I was already seasoned because I put in all my time, but, you know, like this, you know, yeah. by myself. Mm, sure. And you can cultivate what your sound is by yourself and not feel the pressure to do X, Y, and Z because it's trendy. Yeah. 